welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Claire Dunn is the ultimate rewilding pioneer. These days, many people, including myself, are realizing the benefits of eating primal like our ancestors. But really, we are nowhere near living primal using traditional primitive and earth skills in the wild. Claire, on the other hand, regularly hangs out days at a time in the bush and shows people how to do the same. Nothing, though, tops her one year of living wild with no matches, I believe. She makes a living from writing and running workshops with titles ranging from Weed Foraging, Soul Encounter, Mythopoetics and Cultural Transformation, and Fish and Fur, an immersion in traditional leather making. Let's find out a bit more about how she lives a healthy, happy life. Claire Dunn, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ali. Excellent. Look, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, and I am in awe of how you live your life, albeit I know you're uh, fairly urban at the moment. You've had some amazing experiences, and I guess I just wanted to start off by sort of unpacking a bit your lifestyle and how did your upbringing, if it did at all, get you to where you are today? Well, if you compared me to my siblings, you'd wonder what happened. (laughs) My four siblings are all quite, you know, suburban, if you like. But I did grow up on a farm and we had a river at the back of the property. And with three older brothers, it meant I was often down by the river fishing, had a little tracking set, Fisher Price tracking set that I'd use. We didn't have a kind of any really electronics apart from one TV station. So there wasn't much screen time and my parents are both gardeners, so they were outside all the time. So I pretty much grew up roaming on the farm and climbing trees and with lots of animals around. So I'm sure that that really gave me the foundation to be comfortable both in my body but also on the earth. Mm, But presumably your three brothers also grew up in a similar fashion? Well, they did. That's the thing. You know, it's you never can tell how much is nature, how much is nurture. But certainly they do share a love of the outdoors, sports, camping. So it's definitely in, in the family upbringing. My interest took quite a different and more, um, I guess, extreme focus to my siblings. Mm. And was there one sort of incident that happened that made you think, I'm going to live a life of rewilding and be close to nature and be healthy and and live that sort of lifestyle? Or was there several moments that sort of led to that, do you think? Well, there was actually one transformational course that I did, which opened my eyes and switched me on to this whole other level of deep nature connection. That was about more than 10 years ago now. And and by that time, I was in my late 20s and I'd been an activist, an environmental activist and conservationist for pretty much all of my 20s. So that was channeling my love of nature into, you know, into this kind of conservation work, which was both incredibly satisfying, but also I burnt out, essentially. I was trying to play the political game and up against every obstacle there was, as well as living a life that was essentially urban and a lobbyist and high pressure. And I realized that if people don't have a connection to nature, a connection to plants, animals that I'm talking about, then why would they even care what's happening to them? So that sent me on a bit of a search for the deeper root of the ecological crisis that we're in, which is pretty much our disconnection from the life support systems and from the web of life. So that search took me to a course called Nature Philosophy, which was a five-day immersion in bushcraft, wilderness survival skills, and also kind of shamanic spiritual skills and this idea of deep nature connection. There was many moments that week, but certainly collecting bush food and eating bush food around the fire, having my first go at, at lighting fires by rubbing sticks together, one evening, we were blindfolded and it was freezing cold winter night up in the mountains, taken out into the forest and blindfolded. And to teach us about awareness and body control, we were to walk blindfolded through the forest towards the sound of a occasional beating of a drum. And I was so cold when I walked out there, I thought I wouldn't survive. But I had lost all sense of time and just got into an incredibly focused, altered state When I took off my blindfold in my bathing suit in the middle of winter, I didn't feel the cold and I felt more alive than I could remember. 
that was one of the moments that really made me kind of just rethink everything I was doing and, and made an internal commitment to follow that thread, follow that scent trail. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So coming back from that retreat, what did you do? Well, I, I guess business as usual on the outside, but on the inside, I was turning my attention very much to these practices of tracking and wilderness survival skills and deep awareness. And so I kept studying with these people who are now good friends of mine. And the woman who was running the Nature Philosophy had spent a year in America, in New Jersey, actually, at Tom Brown Jr.'s Tracker School, which is a very famous kind of wilderness survival skills school. She'd spent a year there doing a kind of an immersion program. And when I heard about that and heard some of her stories, I just said, I have to do this. I have to do a year in the bush, grounding all these skills, giving myself the, the space and time to dive deeply into these practices. And I said, I don't want to do it in the US. I want to do it on home soil where I get to know the plants and animals and the seasons according to the Australian landscape. So a couple of years later, there I was. We had created Australia's first kind of independent wilderness studies program and six of us showed up on this 100-acre property in the middle of scorching summer heat in north coast New South Wales, prepared to survive four seasons essentially without matches and without a lot of our comforts. So you've written an amazing book, My Year Without Matches. Can you take us through that journey? Did you know these people? How much preparation did it involve? Tell us everything. I did know three others out of the six. It was three men and three women. In the interceding years, the preceding years, I had been over to Tom Brown's school and studied for a couple of summers. So I was pretty skilled up in one way, but also naive. I've never really lived it. And it was a kind of a choose your own adventure. There was very little structure. We were to build our own shelters made from natural materials found on the land and then basically live as much as we could close to the earth. It wasn't like Survivor. We had some bulk dry foods to survive on. That land couldn't support us full time, but I was collecting bush food every day. But essentially, it was following that sacred order of survival, which is shelter, water, fire, food. So my days were really spent, certainly in the first few months, building my shelter, which was an enormous undertaking. I'd never never even put a post in the ground before, let alone build a waterproof shelter out of natural materials. And I also made a commitment to only light fires the entire year by fire by friction, which is either the bow drill or the hand drill both of which require quite a bit of strength and skill and, and tenacity. And that commitment meant that, well, I either didn't cook, <laughs> didn't cook dinner if I didn't get a fire, but it, it really made me learn the skill and get to know the element of fire very intimately. So all of these skills, you know, there was bush food and making rope and string and tanning hides and tracking and bird language and basketry and all sorts of skills. Each one of them was a doorway into a much greater level of intimacy with my environment. Wow. So I've got to ask you, did you get good at eating raw food or were you able to start a fire? I got good at fire. Well I really did. I mean, the bow drill was the technique that I used quite early on and it was pretty much fail safe. There was a couple of times where I was a bit cold and hungry, but it was the hand drill fire technique that I really wanted because it was the, the way that was used by Indigenous Australians for you know thousands of years. So I really wanted to get good at that technique. And that requires a lot of strength. And I'm not a big, strong woman. I'm fairly petite. And it was incredibly challenging. It took all of my courage and determination and, and strength to be able to start making fires that way. And it was incredibly satisfying. And during this choose your own adventure, if you will, did you have any contact with the other five people? We did, yeah. We, it was very much you design your own kind of retreat. So the first few months were quite communal because we all needed help building our own shelters and we were getting set up and it was a little bit looking like it was going to turn into Lord of the Flies. There was, you know, two people coupled up and there was another alliance and it was quite, you know, the, the human story was definitely very present. But, you know, come autumn, late autumn, I really followed that instinct to be alone. 
I was craving solitude and craving retreat time. And so I kind of rolled down my thatched shutters, if you like, and went into quite a hibernation over winter. So for the rest of the year, certainly winter, I would see the others, probably have a conversation in passing most days, but was very much alone, probably for, you know, quite a few months in the middle of the year. And that's what I needed. The others chose their own path, some of which was much more, you know, relationship oriented. But everyone got what they needed. I really wanted to turn my attention to the more than human world, to the elements, the plants, the animals, to the unseen, and yeah, you know, and see what happened in that broader conversation. Mm. And you said everyone got what they needed. What did you get? Oh, many things, so many things. I certainly got that deep retreat time that I was craving. And it was really kind of an unraveling of my old way of being, which was very fast paced, very busy. You know, some might call it a kind of a masculine way of being in the world, very goal oriented and directed and focused. And I tried to approach that year with that same presence and it didn't work. What the year really taught me and what every one of those earth skills taught me was how to slow down and to move from the head to the heart and to exist more in a kind of instinctual, intuitive way of being rather than a kind of directed, focused way of being. And it's still a work in progress because that's pretty much most of our conditioning. You know, perfectionism just didn't really work in the bush. And so it was tough. You know, I really had to let go of a lot of expectations I had about what I would get done in that year or how proficient I would be at tracking by the end of it or all sorts of kind of boxes that I wanted to tick off. And really, I just let go of a lot of the shoulds and learnt how to be more, just really be, you know. And my practices turned into very fluid wandering, especially when I was set up. You know, I had my shelter and I had my little kitchen and I was had my bush Ikea furniture and I'd get up in the morning and take my binoculars and really just wander for hours just sitting walking picking some bush food watching birds soaking it all in and that's where I found that more fluid way of being where it was less about what I was doing and more about presence. That's fascinating can you remember that exact day or that transition or was it over the period of time where you went from doing to being? It was definitely over a period of time but there was a few I guess light bulb moments that was like I can't do this the way I used to do this. I mean fire was a great teacher for that. Learning the traditional Indigenous Australian method of fire, you know, I was pouring myself into it trying and trying and trying and then I remembered Tom Brown Jr. saying, trying negates the effort. I thought, what does he mean by that? How can you want something more than anything? How can you want something but not try for it? So I tied a blindfold around my eyes and engaged in the fire making process blindfolded. And something in that shifted my kind of way of approaching it. And I was no longer trying to figure out how far I was from success. I was just really in the moment, engaging with the feel of the wood grinding on the wood and the smell of the wood smoke. And when I took my blindfold off, I had a little red ember, one of my first little red embers. And it was such a strong lesson for me in surrender and letting go and trust and, you know, passion, yes, but not with the trying and the striving. So that was a really key moment for me that year. Mm. And so after you found shelter, uh, you know, the first couple of months and you started moving towards this being, what did a typical day look like? Well, I was trying not to have any kind of routine, unlike the birds around me, which I discovered had a very clear routine. All the animals around me, you know, had their breakfast run and their dinner run and, and I watched that with great pleasure. I tried not to have much of a routine. I really wanted to kind of mix things up and, you know, sometimes stay up late in the night or wake up early. But generally, I would wake up with the birds. The first thing I'd do is wander down to my sit spot. And my sit spot was a place about five minutes walk from my shelter that was kind of like my, I don't know, nature classroom, if you like. It was one spot that I sat. It was on top of a giant upturned 
tree, so I was kind of nestled in the in the root ball, and I would sit there for maybe an hour, my binoculars, just watching, just tuning in, learning the language of the birds, and then it was like my anchor point, and then from then I would just wander out, so I'd then go exploring wherever the curiosity took me. I might have a piece of fruit with me and some water, and then I'd wander back to my shelter maybe mid-morning and If I could be bothered, I'd light a fire, (laughs) which took a while sometimes. Light a fire, make some breakfast, have a cup of tea, write in my journal, do some reading. And then depending on what I was interested in, I I usually had some kind of project on, like I was tanning a hide or I was weaving a basket. I might just keep walking. But depending on the season, you know, if it was summer, I might go down to the waterhole and take my project down there. But usually I'd have something that I was fiddling around or building or creating And then the days were so short in winter that doing a bit of this and that, and then suddenly I'd find it was four o'clock and starting to get dark and I'd start lighting a fire again and collecting wood took a while. And the long winter nights in my shelter, I'd weave string or continue with my basket weaving or just have early nights and lots of sleep really. But you know, I, I was never bored and there was always more to do that I wanted to do. I didn't really get nearly as much kind of skill practice in as I thought I would. I thought with a whole year without any structure, without any phones or computers, there'd be just this never-ending time. But I was definitely occupied. I wouldn't say busy, but I was really engaged and really occupied. And I don't remember once being bored. Mm, Interesting. And what skills and practices did you pick up? You mentioned a few of them. Yeah. So certainly lots of the, you know, what they call hard skills or the physical skills, which is all the the hide tanning, basket weaving, rope making, fire lighting, water, and bush food, you know, learning the food and the medicinals, which was such joy. I really loved that aspect. And then there was more of the kind of awareness or naturalist aspects of it, which was much more subtle. So I was tuning into the language of the birds. It was learning how to kind of walk in a traditional way, in an ancient way, and how to see. So Rather than this tunnel vision, narrow tunnel vision, which we seem to be so good at with our screens and our books and our roads, this was more about expanding my sense of vision. And instead of walking with the modern heel stomp, I learned to walk. I was mostly barefoot, walk what they call fox walking, so walking softly on the earth. And those two skills combined really shifted my awareness as I practiced them during the day and during the evening, really shifted my awareness. And I was also doing a a meditation every day that was a listening meditation. So letting all the sounds of the forest kind of come to me rather than seeking them out and feeling where they landed in my body. So it was a kind of a sensitizing practice. Mm. So all these practices combined with the bird language really created a kind of a dynamic meditation where I wasn't really sitting eyes closed much at all, but I was in a kind of a, a listening, a deep listening and a receptive space a lot of the time. So, you know, those simple practices were so powerful. Yeah. And it sounds like you did a bit of walking. Was there a walking meditation a lot of the time? Well, in a kind of a dynamic way, I wasn't walking a certain track or doing the kind of, you know, walking back and forth. But because my walk was slow, and I really find there's a correlation between the slower I walk the slower my thoughts are in a way. So the wandering was actually one of the core practices of the year. And wandering is so different to that feeling of being on a bushwalk where you know where you're going and you've got a pack on your back and you're out there for exercise or recreation. It has a focus and I'm getting up to the top of the mountain. and, And look, I enjoy that kind of thing as well. But wandering is just a completely different experience. It almost sounds like wondering like it's a wander is really a walk where I'm wondering and I'm in curiosity and I'm just following where I feel to go. So I might be interested in a bird's nest that I find and then that might lead me to some ochre in the creek and then I might wonder what's up ahead or where does that track go and I'll just keep wandering and wondering until I find myself somewhere that I stop and this practice of really sinking into what does this body feel like doing right now? What is Where do I feel drawn to rather than letting the mind direct me? That was definitely one of the most powerful practices. And so I did a lot of walking, but you know I probably didn't go that far. 
there was a national park that was adjacent to where we were living. So that gave me some longer walks up into some really wild areas. But just a kind of, you know, few kilometer radius around my shelter was filled with wonder and curiosity and all sorts of kind of explorations to be had. And you mentioned exercise or you mentioned listening to your body. Did your body ever want to do not so much wandering but actual physical cardio exercise? definitely. Mm. And I was really kind of testing the edges of my body. So I was fasting one day a week, usually completely just fasting with water, and my diet was incredibly clean apart from a lack of fresh food sometimes. But I really did want to get quite fit as well. We set up a bush gym. One of the guys was really into kind of natural movement. And so we set up a bush gym with like beams and bars and climbing equipment and all out of logs and lashed together. So I was building up my strength on the bush gym, but also I had a kind of a jogging loop that it took me about 45 minutes to jog this loop. And I'd do that fair few times a week, actually, depending on the season. You know, I was jumping over logs and it wasn't just a kind of flat track. It was up and down. So I really enjoyed that, definitely really needed that kind of cardio workout. And fire was also a, intense bursts of cardio because you only really have a few minutes to try and make a fire before you run out of energy, run out of muscle power. So fire and jogging in the bush gym And I was also doing yoga. I had my yoga mat. That was one of my luxuries I took with me. It was just so fantastic to be so physical, you know, to be off the computer altogether. And my life was incredibly embodied. It sounds amazing. Yeah, moment to moment. I mean, I was was always using my body in some way. There wasn't, apart from kind of writing in my journal and reading a bit, I was pretty active and, and also just very physically connected to my environment, whether I was barefoot or mosquitoes on me or whatever, I was pretty much exposed to the elements. So when it all came to an end, was it quite sad? Because to me, it sounds like the perfect life. Well, I didn't really realize it at the time. I felt ready to go and, you know, back out in the world and see friends and family. And I, towards the end of the year, I had this idea of writing a book about my experiences because it had been so transformational and been such a spiritual journey on many levels. So I felt ready to leave, but Quite soon after I did, I realized I was overcome with grief, really, because it was the most connected I'd ever felt, both to humans, but also to myself and the non-human world, to the land. When those three things are humming along, connection to self and the land, life's thriving. I mean, that's a recipe for thriving for me. So once I was back, you know, living within four walls, without my tribe, trying to write a book on a computer, I really struggled. I really felt a huge amount of grief, what one of my teachers, John Young, calls hitting the wall of grief. When you get so connected, you realize the state of disconnection of our society. And so it was a very difficult transition, and I really only feel like I've been coming out of it in the last couple of years. Mm, And I imagine, too, your senses would have felt quite overloaded on top of that, maybe even a cultural shock to a certain extent. Well, the cultural shock, I didn't move back to the city straight away. I did live out in the bush on just out of a small community for the first 18 months. But even that was a cultural shock just in terms of the pace of life, the financial demands, and also just the lack of community, the lack of the feeling of the village. And even though I didn't spend a huge amount of time with my others who shared the experience with me, it was still a very strong sense of tribe or village which enabled me to have my kind of supported solitude, if you like. That was a shock, this kind of, you know, everyone just living their isolated lives in their four walls. It's not not how I thrive. I don't think many people thrive in that way. I think we've learned to adapt, but I'd experienced something very different. So going back to that kind of disconnected world was difficult. Mm, that's interesting, Claire, and I'd love to come back to that in a moment. Before we do, though, I just wanted to ask you about your nutrition over the Mm. year. You mentioned a few things about some medicinals that you found and you learned about. You also mentioned that it wasn't always fresh stuff at hand. Mm. What did a typical day look like or did it vary quite a lot? It did vary quite a lot. I probably went into town once a month to restock on supplies, maybe a little less than that. But I was eating quite a lot of rice and oats and quinoa and lentils 
<laughs> and produce that would keep, so sweet potatoes and eggs. We did have a garden and I was growing lots of fresh greens, but obviously nothing really that, that I could refrigerate. So I was pretty much gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, um, apart from oats, which have some gluten in nuts I would use and also I was soaking nuts soaking my grain soaking lentils sprouting so I was sprouting food which was great I lost quite a lot of weight actually I don't think I was eating enough I needed more fat so I started eating coconut oil when I could get hold of it there was always something fruiting that I was eating there was berries or some shoots or roots that I'd eat every day there was always something but it's not like the fruit we're used to. It's bush food fruit is just not that sweet. And you have to have a lot of it to get many calories. So I wasn't quite getting enough and definitely eating some meat. I did have a couple of successful hunts and there was roadkill that people were bringing us or we were finding. So we were using that where it was good, which was quite confronting. I probably wasn't getting enough protein in hindsight. I needed more meat and that needed more skill in hunting. So that's something I'd do differently next time is make sure I, I was getting enough protein. But I also felt like quite well, like very light and light. I'd had a lot of digestive problems and I didn't really have much of that that year, which was fantastic. It's only been since coming back and eating more um, diverse food and lots of different ingredients and going out that I've started kind of feeling those digestive issues that come back again. But it was a very clean, very simple diet. And did you build your own hunting materials? I did make a fish spear, which didn't end up catching anything, and I made an eel trap, which got washed away in the flood. The successful hunts were from a snare trap out of just parachute cord. Some of the guys got more into hunting. I felt like I was better at gathering plant food. Hmm. And what medicinals did you find? Well, things like the bloodwood trees that were quite abundant would ooze this incredibly, well, that's why it's called bloodwood, like red sap. I'd use that on cuts and scratches and things. Also, the bracken fern, you crush up the bracken fern and put it on any bites. It took away the stings from the ants and mosquitoes. So they were probably the two most common medicinals I used. Great. And so it sounds like you were very fit and very healthy throughout this year. Mm. Would you say that that was probably the most fit and healthy you'd ever felt? I would say it's definitely the fittest I've ever felt, yes. I was really strong. You know, I came back and I was like, wow, wow, I've got muscles. I'd never really experienced that sense of being really strong. It was fantastic. I loved it and I <laughs> I mourn not having that feeling so much anymore. Definitely felt the fittest and healthiest. The only thing is I think I lost a bit too much weight through just not having enough protein and I. And I felt a bit depleted in some nutrients, which in hindsight just needed some more attention. I probably went a little bit hardcore on the fasting and the fitness. But it was a lesson, you know. I, I tested my edge and got to my edge and now know what that feels like. But I certainly felt incredibly alive, which is what we all want really. Mm. It's hard to find that sense of aliveness back in the modern world. Which I guess brings me to my next question. Why are you in the modern world when you could be out there? And I know, though, let me say that you do actually run a lot of workshops that take people out there to experience a taste of that lifestyle. But why aren't you out there full time? Well, it's a good question, Ali. As I was describing the year to you over the last half an hour, I was thinking, why don't I just go back out there and do this again? And look, I might, but I think there's something in me that's always, you know, I've got the heart of a social activist, if you like. I care so deeply about the direction that our world is going in and I want to play my part in contributing towards, you know, a change in direction of a life-affirming world where people are living their visions and living well and healthy. So I could just hide away in the bush and do my own thing, but I don't feel like that's what's needed in this day and age. I think we're all required to play our part in this transition that the world's in. Well, it's seven years since I've had that experience and I feel like that seven-year cycle, I'm kind of ready for another immersion again. But for now, I've found it incredibly satisfying to tell my story through my book and through taking people out to the bush and, and also exploring these skills in an urban setting. And it's been amazing to meet so many people who are interested in this 
way of living, this kind of idea of rewilding the body and mind and spirit. So I'm quite passionate about being involved in that movement. I love what you're addressing now, and that is that most of us actually do live in this urban environment. And what I love is that you're bringing rewilding to our urban life as much as possible. And I hear a rumor that you are writing a book about exploring rewilding in the urban lifestyle. Is that correct? It is correct, although it's very hard to get me to sit down on a computer um, these days. But I am very slowly writing another book. I have a publisher awaiting my first draft of yeah, an exploration into rewilding in, in an urban context because I live in Melbourne. I do happen to live on an incredible rental property, which is both close-ish to the city and also right on the river. So I feel like I'm living the best of both worlds. But it's a question for me, an ongoing question. How can I live in a kind of primal way or an intuitive way or an instinctive way where I'm deeply connected to the earth and myself and to my community while living in an urban and suburban setting? And I'm not doing it perfectly. I get too busy way too often and I lose the sense of connectedness and I lose track of my practices. But then I come back and today I'll be out foraging some wild weeds in preparation for a workshop and I've been down at my sit spot this morning observing the flow of life. It's a living question but I believe in it because most people live in urban settings so we have to be able to connect deeply where we are in our homes rather than going out to the wilderness. It's not practical and we need to do it where we are and starting in our own homes and in our backyards and re-looking at everything from our food to our footwear and really feeling into, does this serve me? Does this bring me alive? Does this bring my body, mind and soul alive? Claire, I appreciate I'm putting you on the spot here, but I don't think I can wait for your book. So, I mean, (laughs) of course I'll read it when it comes out, but in the meantime, could you give me and our listeners maybe three tips that we could take away, implement in our lives that would really help us explore rewilding in our our urban settings? Sure. And bear in mind, I'm in the middle of Manhattan. Manhattan. Okay. Well, the first and kind of main suggestion would be to find a sit spot. That's really anywhere that you can sit, hopefully a few times a week for about half an hour at least, and observe some sense of wildness, some sense of wildness. That could be a tree in your backyard. It could be going to Central Park and just finding a spot that feels like you're observing more than human world. And That's it, just deeply immersing yourself in that place as much as you can and apprenticing yourself to that place. The wild is accessible anywhere, the sky, the weeds coming up through the pavement, the movement of the birds, and just being in that kind of receptive state a few times a week is incredibly valuable. And one of the practices I find really powerful for rewilding in the urban setting is learning some foraging. There's always edible weeds in all our parks. Learning five major common weeds in your park and learning how to forage them and how to prepare them like a wild weed salad is incredibly satisfying. And maybe the last tip would be that sense of wide angle vision. So, really expanding your sense of vision so that you're not in that tunnel vision state all the time. There's that state of dreaminess, of deep listening, opening up your senses, sight hearing, touch, smell, just actively really opening up the senses. And what am I missing? Asking that question, what am I not hearing? What am I not smelling? What am I not feeling right now? What am I not seeing? And becoming like a sponge, soaking it all in, even in the city. That last one, opening up the senses, I find very difficult to do in in a loud environment. So I guess you're sort of inferring that maybe your, your sit spot is where you do that. Yeah, the sit spot and also trying it, you know, experimenting with what it's like to kind of really open up the senses and then actively kind of come back to a state of awareness that is not overwhelming because, yeah, if you're walking around in that completely open state all the time in Manhattan, I imagine a little overwhelming. But just knowing what it's like to really expand and letting the sounds move through you rather than getting stuck in you. Okay, and then turning down the dial so that you're not becoming overwhelmed, but becoming, yeah, acquainted with that sense of like wide open receptive sensory awareness. 
Mm, I love it. And the foraging one is going to be a challenge for me because I've never tried that. So I may get arrested in Central Park, but I'm going to, I'm <laughs> going to give it a go. Well, when I was in Manhattan, there was someone running weed foraging workshops. So, you know, there might be some teachers out there for you. Oh, excellent. Okay, we'll have to check that out. Look, Claire, thank you so much for your tips and your inspiration. And I guess I just wanted to ask you also about what your picture of someone that's fit and healthy looks like. Well, I guess it's less of a kind of aesthetic and more of an internal feeling of wellness, a mean a sense of aliveness, like a vitality sense of waking up in the morning with energy, with a sense of purpose in the world, a sense of contentment, like a an okayness with life, or like an acceptance of whatever is, is okay. And, you know, a physical body that feels strong enough, it's flexible enough to carry oneself into the world in a way that is conducive to aliveness, that has enough vitality and strength and flexibility to move well, to move like the animals that we are. That's my quick mm. overview of, a, of an alive being. Awesome. Well, on behalf of the planet, I'd like to thank you. And mm. before I let you go, I've got to ask you a question that I ask all our guests on the show. Do you have a tattoo? <laughs> I don't have a tattoo. I have been looking at some of these beautiful botanical tattoos and considering something quite subtle and, and detailed, but not as yet. <laughs> So if you were to, a botanical tattoo could be the way to go. A little fern or something perhaps, yep. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Look, thanks again, Claire, and we await your book. I'm going to put all your contact details, including your website, Nature's Apprentice, in our show notes. So um, we can all follow you, look at your books and look at your workshops that are coming out. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for having me on the show, Ali. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.